these slides. All right. Uh, well, let me start by thanking the philosophy department here, uh, especially Dr. Cullison, for organizing the Young Philosophers Lecture Series. Um, I hope that you students know what a talented and well-respected group of philosophers you have access to here. Um, in the circles I run in, the Young Philosophers Lecture Series is considered to be a pretty big deal. Um, the, the cat's pajamas, as the kids say. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be a part of that lecture series. It's also a real pleasure to be a part of a profession where 31 years old is still considered young. Uh, that's real nice. Compares really favorably to like gymnastics or <laughs> advertising, where someone my age is already as good as dead. Uh, the title of my talk today, as uh, Dr. Collison said, is Overdetermination, Backtracking, and Physicalism. The subtitle is, I wish I had a better title. Uh, not quite as catchy as I'd like, but it serves really well as an outline. Uh, we'll be covering these topics in this order. Start with overdetermination, then we'll talk about backtracking, and we'll close with the payoff, some implications for physicalism about the mind. So first, overdetermination, uh, what is it? Well, I think that we have a pre-philosophical or pre-theoretical grasp of this concept. And it's basically any situation that fits this pattern. A situation where we've got an effect brought about by two simultaneous sufficient causes. Two simultaneous sufficient causes. So for example, consider two kids throwing bricks at a window. Uh, each kid throws a brick. The bricks strike the window at the same time. The window breaks. I think we can make sense in a pre-philosophical way of um, a sense in which this is overdetermined. We had more than enough causes, more than enough oomph to get the job done. Two simultaneous sufficient causes. So that's what overdetermination is. Uh, it's relevant to a lot of debates in philosophy, but today we'll be considering its relevance to the philosophy of mind, specifically certain views about mental causation. Because some views of mental causation seem to fit this pattern. For example, just consider an ordinary kind of bodily behavior, say taking an aspirin, your hand goes up, uh, in goes the aspirin. We think that at least in the ordinary case, uh, we're perfectly comfortable citing mental causes for this sort of behavior. Typically, you take aspirin because you feel pain. So we're perfectly comfortable, in fact, we like, that, uh, we like the idea that our mental states are getting into the causal story. Uh, so we often cite mental states as causes. But at the same time, we think that all of our mental states have what's what are called neural correlates, some corresponding state in the brain. So for example, with pain, whenever we have that sensation, there's increased activity in our somatosensory cortex. Um, and it's perfectly correlated with the feeling of pain. And we think that this, this brain state, which occurs simultaneously with the pain, uh, sets off a cascade of events that um, eventually leads to the taking of the aspirin. And we know pretty well how that works. Uh, you've got, you start with some brain state, nerves fire down your spine into your muscles, your muscles contract, and bam, the aspirin goes in. So we also want to endorse uh, what you might call the causal completeness of physics. For every physical event like this, the moving of my hand, um, there is some prior sufficient physical cause. And we think the brain state's playing, that, playing a role in that cause. So we're starting to fit the pattern of overdetermination, and if you endorse, as this picture suggests, that the mental state is not reducible to the brain state, that we've really got two states here, and there's not even a necessary connection between the two, then you are what philosophers call a dualist. So this is dualism with respect to mental causation, two distinct uh, sufficient causes. And it sure looks like it's fitting that pattern of overdetermination. Historically, dualism has been quite a popular view. It's fallen on hard times over the last hundred years or so. Um, and I think largely for considerations like this. Uh, this sort of picture of how mental causation works strikes people as problematic. And I think the most salient problem is um, there's no necessary connection between 
the pain in the corresponding brain state. And so you're left with a, a picture like this. Every, every time you get a, a mental cause, you have a corresponding physical cause. Every time. So there's some widespread systematic overdetermination that seems to involve a lot of luck. We've got a lot of uh, suspicious coincidences here. And these coincidences are quite fortuitous for us. I mean, it, it sure does benefit us that um, our mental states always go along with these uh, corresponding brain states. That sure is nice for us. And so a lot of people think this looks a little too fishy, a little too fortuitous, and frankly a little too religious. This sort of view fits quite nicely with um, certain religious views that people might hold. For example, views about the possibility of life after death, uh, a continued mental life after the destruction of our bodies. If there is no necessary connection between the mind and the brain, if that connection is just contingent, a matter of sheer coincidence, then in principle it's possible for our mental life to continue even after our bodies have been destroyed. So dualism is quite friendly to that religious view, and in fact, it's more than friendly. It, John Wright seems to support it. Um, I mean, a lot of early modern philosophers in the face of these sorts of coincidences uh, were um, happy to explain them in terms of what John Locke called God's good pleasure. Here's why. You always get these states um, corresponding to one another. Here's what explains the coincidences. God's good pleasure. Uh, so this sort of view seems to lend itself to a kind of design argument for a capital D designer. A lot of people find that uncomfortable, and so they feel pressure to reject this sort of dualist view for one variety or another of physicalism. And these days, a very popular view is what's called non-reductive physicalism. Superficially, it looks a lot like dualism, but here's an important difference. There is a necessary connection between the brain state and the pain. And that's, help, that's meant to help sort of diffuse these uh, concerns about suspicious, widespread, systematic coincidences. Um, but still, this view fits our intuitive conception of overdetermination. We still have two distinct, sufficient causes for um, our typical bodily behaviors, where we want to cite mental causes. And so there are still concerns about this view relating to overdetermination. It looks like it still involves overdetermination, because we're not identifying the mental state with the physical state. We're just saying there's a necessary connection tying them together. So we've still got two uh, distinct, sufficient causes for our bodily behaviors. Uh, so non-reductive physicalists are sensitive to this concern. They're interested in defending themselves from this objection, the objection that non-reductive physicalism involves widespread systematic overdetermination. And I think the best defense um, was offered by a philosopher named Karen Bennett. Here she is defending non-reductive physicalism in the face of a famous dualist, David Chalmers. <laughs> so her defense goes like um, it goes like this. And, you might want to know that in philosophy of mind, a lot of debates degenerate into just pure, no holds barred, bare knuckle boxing. It happens all the time. Here it is, uh, happening right in front of your eyes. Um, so her defense goes like this Our intuitive conception of overdetermination is incomplete. There's a further necessary condition that has to be met for a case to involve genuine overdetermination. It's not enough for there to just be two uh, simultaneous sufficient causes. A further condition has to be met. And here's the condition she proposes. She says that an event or an effect will be overdetermined by two causes, C1 and C2, only if this condition is met. Uh, first, we've got to evaluate this counterfactual. If one cause had happened while the other cause hadn't happened, and you would still get the effect, then this condition is met. So you meant to ask yourself, what if one cause had happened and the other cause hadn't? Would you still get the effect? And you need to ask yourself, hey, what if the second cause had happened without the first cause? Would you still get the effect? She says in order for there to be genuine overdetermination, both of these conditions have to come out as non-trivially true. They have to be substantially true. Um, so again, consider the case of the uh, kids throwing bricks. Each throws a brick at the same time they strike the window. That seems to pass this test for overdetermination because if just one kid had thrown the brick, just the kid on the right, if he'd thrown the brick, uh, you would still get the windows breaking. 
And if just the kid on the left had thrown the brick, he'd still get the effects. The window would still break. So both of these come out as true in those classic cases of overdetermination. Um, so those cases pass the test. They meet this necessary condition. But she wants to argue non-reductive physicalism fails this test. Non-reductive physicalism fails this test. And that's because, remember, here's, here's non-reductive physicalism. We've got this necessary connection between the mental and the physical. It fails the test when you consider this counterfactual. Hey, what if the brain state had been there while the mental state wasn't there? What if you just had the brain state without the mental state? Well, she points out that that's impossible in this view. Remember, we have this necessary connection between the brain state and the mental state. You can't have the brain state without the mental state. So she thinks that counterfactual, if the brain state had been there without the mental state, you'd still get the effect taken of the aspirin. She thinks that counterfactual is either going to come out as false, or depending on your view, uh, depending on your view on the semantics of counterfactuals, it might come out as trivially true because it involves an impossible antecedent, uh, namely a situation where you have a brain state without the pain. That's impossible on this view. Okay, so here's, here's her argument in defense of non-reductive physicalism. She says, look, a case involves the kind of overdetermination that worries us only if these counterfactuals are both non-trivially true, only if it passes the test. Both of the counterfactuals come out as true. But with respect to non-reductive physicalism, the, both those counterfactuals are not both non-trivially true. One of them is either false or trivially true. And so, she concludes, non-reductive physicalism doesn't involve the kind of overdetermination that worries us. So what I want to do next is try to convince you that um, premise one here is false. I want to target premise one. I want to try to describe a counterexample to the first premise, a case that involves um, paradigmatic overdetermination. It's a clear case of overdetermination, and yet it fails Bennett's test. It's not the case that both of the counterfactuals come out as non-trivially true. One of them comes out as false. And so what I'll try to show is that this test for overdetermination is not a good one. Sometimes it misses paradigm cases of overdetermination. Sometimes it misses clear cases of overdetermination. So the fact that non-reductive physicalism passes the test, or sorry, fails the test, um, the fact that non-reductive physicalism fails the test doesn't guarantee that there's no overdetermination there, because some cases of clear overdetermination can fail the test. All right. So here, here's the counterexample I propose. It's going to be a case of overdetermination, but one of those counterfactuals comes out as false. It fails Bennett's test. So uh, consider Brutus and Kafka. They're two members of a very small assassination squad. Um, and they're in ancient Rome, so they have to use knives. They throw knives at their targets. Uh, Kafka is the lookout, or the scout. He throws from further away um, when he judges that their position has not been compromised. If he looks around and says, OK, my position's good. Uh, the target's in sight, uh, then Casca throws. Brutus is the fail-safe. He's there to ensure that the job gets done. So he notes whether or not Casca throws, but regardless of whether Casca throws, Brutus is going to try to finish the job. Um, but he takes note of whether Casca throws. Uh, on this occasion, everything goes according to plan. Casca surveys the scene, decides that his position's good, the target's in sight. Um, their target today is Julius the Dictator. Casca uh, throws his knife from further away. Brutus notes that Casca has thrown his knife, and then Brutus throws his knife from closer to the target. And since Brutus was closer, uh, the knives managed to hit the target at exactly the same time. Two knives through the heart, uh, more than enough to kill the Dictator. And the Dictator does, in fact, die. So this is a paradigm case of overdetermination, I think. It's just a minor variation on classic cases of overdetermination. You could do this with bricks and windows instead of knives and murder. <laughs> but I went with the knives. Uh, all right, so clear case of overdetermination. So we're halfway to a counterexample. Halfway to a counterexample. Uh, so let me add some more to the story to um, help this scenario fail 
Bennett's test for help uh, one of those counterfactuals was the Canatus false. Let me add this to the story. Um, Brutus is a very sensitive soul. He's not really cut out for this assassination game. Um, on all the occasions in the past when Casca has refrained from throwing, Brutus has felt really nervous because now the pressure's on him. It's up to him to finish the job. And more time has passed, so now he realizes, ah, oh, time is short. It's all on me. Um, on all the occasions when Casca has failed to throw in the past, Brutus has felt nervous, and as a result, his aim is um, much less accurate. We don't have to make it completely inaccurate, we just have to make it uh, so accurate that um, he easily might miss his target. We don't need it to be true that he would miss, we just need it to be true that he easily might miss. Okay, so now let's consider Bennett's test. Remember, Bennett asks us uh, to run this test to see if there's overdetermination. Ask yourself, what if one cause had been there and the other cause hadn't, would you still get the effects? What if the other cause had been there and the first cause hadn't, would you still get the effect? Well, consider one of those counterfactuals. Suppose that Casca hadn't thrown. Suppose Casca hadn't thrown. Uh, what's going to happen with Brutus? Specifically, uh, think about this counterfactual. If Brutus had thrown alone, the dictator would still have died. Is that true or false? Now, I think it's false, given the way that I flushed out the scenario, because I think that if Casca hadn't thrown, well, that would be because Casca had noticed that his position was compromised, as has happened in the past, and as has happened every time in the past, uh, Brutus would notice that Casca hadn't thrown. Brutus would have felt nervous as a result. And so Brutus easily might have missed the dictator. I don't think it's true that he would have still killed the dictator. He might have, but he easily might not have. All right, so I don't think it's true that if Brutus had thrown alone, the dictator would still have died. It's not true that you would still get the effect. You easily might not. And so we've got a counterexample here to Bennett's proposed necessary condition on overdetermination. Um, we've got a case of two simultaneous sufficient causes. Um, it's a paradigm case of overdetermination, and yet it fails her test. So she's aware of cases like this, and she points out that this, cases like this involve what's called backtracking. Usually when we evaluate counterfactuals, as the counterfactual unfolds from antecedent to consequent, we move forward in time. So like if I were to win the lottery tomorrow, then I would buy a boat. First the lottery, then the boat. That's usually how counterfactuals work. But some counterfactuals go backwards in time as you progress to the consequent. Um, so for example, I am married, but it's true that if I were not, it's not, I am married. It's true that if I were a bachelor, then I wouldn't have been married in the past. If I were a bachelor now, something would be different about the past, namely I wouldn't have been married. So uh, counterfactuals can do that, they can backtrack. Um, if I were a physician now, then I would have gone to medical school. That seems right. Uh, but what Bennett says is, hey, when we evaluated this black counterfactual, the counterfactual in black, if Brutus had thrown alone, he easily might have missed. That strikes us as true. She points out that when we evaluated that counterfactual, we engaged in some backtracking reasoning. We thought roughly this way, well, if Brutus had thr thrown alone, he would have noticed that Casca hadn't thrown, Brutus would have felt nervous, and that's why he easily might have missed. So we move backward in time from Brutus's throw to what he would have noticed about Casca and how he would have felt before the throw. So we did some backtracking reasoning to evaluate that counterfactual in black. And the red part is meant to represent the backtracking reasoning. So she points that out, Karen Bennett points that out, and she says, here's the problem with proposed counterexamples like this. Backtracking evaluations are not always and everywhere wrong, but they are definitely inappropriate in some contexts, and I hereby claim that this is one of them. Uh, to get the proper results from the overdetermined nation test, you can't backtrack. So I'll admit my initial response to this was uh, I was sort of unsatisfied. Let's say that I, I felt like um, Bennett doesn't really have the authority to declare whether or not we use backtracking reasoning when evaluating these counterfactuals. Uh, that's just the way counterfactuals work. You know, she can't legislate uh, from the throne how we evaluate uh, counterfactuals. 
Um, so I was wondering if there's anything behind this declaration, just this bald declaration, if there's any reasoning one might give to think that backtracking reasoning here is inappropriate. Um, you won't find it in Bennett, but I think some light can be shed on this issue by uh, considering a classic article in this literature um, by David Lewis. It's just called Causation. So I'll now take a look at his reasoning. He gives an argument to think that backtracking evaluations are inappropriate. Uh, so we'll look at his argument, and I'll try to convince you that David Lewis was wrong. <laughs> uh, when you put it that way, it doesn't sound so promising, but I'll do my best. Um, he was kind of a big deal. I don't know if you know that. He's, he's a great philosopher. Um, all right, so here's what he says in that paper. He's interested in analyzing this notion, the notion of causal dependence. Uh, what is it for one event to depend causally on another? Um, so again, just think about just think about one brick this time, throwing a brick at a window. We have this intuitive sense in which the window's breaking depends on the bricks being thrown. The bricks being thrown is the explanation that, that explains why the window broke. And so he gives this analysis of causal dependence. He says, here's what it is for an effect to depend on its cause. Um, it's this. If the cause were not to occur, the effect would not occur either. So in the case of the window, that seems to get at something important. Um, here's why the window's breaking depends on the brick. If you hadn't thrown the brick, the window wouldn't have broken. That seems right. Um, so if you, hadn't, if you hadn't had the cause there, you wouldn't have the effect either. That's what it is for the effect to depend on its cause. Uh, but he was aware of this objection. He considers this objection towards the end of the paper. Imagine this objection. Oof. Suppose that some cause brings about a later event, and suppose that the effect, that later event, must occur given the cause plus the facts of the scenario and the laws of nature. So that seems right in the case of the brick. If you throw a brick of that mass at that velocity and it hits that part of the window, the window has to break. That's just, that's just physics. Uh, there's no way around it. The effect must occur. And so it looks like this counterfactual is going to come out as true. If the effect hadn't occurred, well then the cause wouldn't have occurred either. If the window hadn't broken, wouldn't that have to be because the brick hadn't been thrown? That seems right. If the brick had been thrown, here comes the brick at the same mass, at the same velocity, hitting the same part of the window. How could the window fail to break? And so it looks like it comes out that uh, the cause depends on the effect. C causally depends on E. And that seems wrong. We want effects to depend on their causes, um, but we don't want causes to depend on their effects. So that was the objection. Uh, Lewis's account locates too much causal dependence in the world. It um, overgenerates causal dependence. So here is Lewis's response. Lewis, like Bennett, points out that there was some backtracking reasoning involved in the objection. There was some backtracking reasoning. Namely, that if the effect hadn't occurred, the cause would not have occurred either. So we imagine the effect not occurring, and then we go back in time and ask what would have to be true of the cause. And then we decide, yeah, the cause wouldn't be there either. So he points out that there's backtracking reasoning. But unlike Bennett, Lewis doesn't just declare that you can't use backtracking evaluations. Um, instead, he gives an argument. And his argument's a little bit dense. I don't know, I've already asked you to follow me down several layers of dialectic here. But just stick with me for five more minutes when we get to the payoff. So here's Lewis's argument um, for the conclusion that uh, this objection fails because of backtracking reasoning. He doesn't declare it out of bounds. Instead, he says, this backtracking counterfactual strikes us as true. It appears true, but really it's false. It's not illegitimate to use it. You're just you're suffering from an illusion. You think it's true, but it's really false. Here's why it's false. He says, if the effect had been absent, it's not true that the cause would have been absent as well. Rather, the cause would have occurred just as it did, but it would have failed to cause the effect. So he thinks that this counterfactual is false. The effect hadn't occurred, the cause would still be there, it just would fail to bring about the effect. He says, um, here's why. It's less of a departure from actuality to get rid of an effect by holding the cause fixed and giving up some or other of the laws and circumstances in virtue of which the cause could not have failed to bring about the effect. 
rather than to hold those laws and circumstances fixed and get rid of the effects by going back and abolishing its cause. So his idea here, his, his theory about counterfactuals said when we consider the antecedent of a counterfactual, like if I were to win the lottery, if I were to win the lottery, we try to find the scenario which is most similar to the actual world except that I've won the lottery in that scenario. We go to the nearest or most similar scenario in which the antecedent's true, and then we see how things unfold. What would happen in that scenario that's just like this one except that I've won the lottery? And he says if you're looking for the nearest scenario, if you're trying to depart from actuality um, the least, then you should prefer a scenario where we get rid of an effect by holding the cause fixed and just temporarily suspending some laws of nature, um, admitting some minor miracles. So here's what he says in another work. He says, when we evaluate the antecedents of counterfactuals and we're looking for the nearest or most similar possible world where the antecedent's true, we should favor small, localized, simple violations of law if that allows us to maximize the spatiotemporal region throughout which perfect match of particular effect prevails. So here's the idea. Remember, we're throwing a brick at a window. We've got a cause and an effect. We ask ourselves, what if the window hadn't broken? What if the window hadn't broken? So we just imagine a counterfactual with the antecedent, if the window hadn't broken. And we're wondering how the world would have unfolded. So what would the world be like if the window hadn't broken? Two options. On the one hand, maybe the brick wouldn't have been thrown in that scenario either. Maybe the nearest scenario in which the window's not broken is one where the brick's not thrown. Here we don't have to cite any miracles, we just abolish the bricks being thrown. Um, but there is less spatiotemporal overlap. Um, the scenario we're considering less closely matches the actual scenario. Because remember, in the actual scenario, we've got a brick being thrown. In this scenario, in the lower left, there's no brick being thrown. So less spatiotemporal overlap. But no miracles, we just don't have a brick being thrown. Alternatively, maybe this is the right answer to the question, what if the window hadn't broken? This is Lewis's answer. He says you would still get a brick being thrown, it would just fail to bring about the effect. Maybe we temporarily suspend the laws of nature, so here comes the brick, and then it just sticks to the window or something, or it just falls off, um, or it just evaporates. Uh, I don't know what happens. Some, some minor, try to keep the violations of law minor, um, but there's some minor miracle. Uh, that takes place. Uh, so we do have to count in some minor miracle, which is a little weird, but we get to maximize spatiotemporal overlap. In the actual scenario, there was a brick being thrown. Here in the scenario, there's a brick being thrown as well. Lewis's theory of counterfactuals rules that we should prefer the scenario. We should think that if the window hadn't broken, um, it's not true that the brick wouldn't have been thrown. Uh, the brick still would have been thrown. It just would have failed to bring about the effect. Okay, now let's bring it back to mental causation. Here was the counterexample I asked you to consider. We've got Brutus and Casca throwing knives at the dictator. Um, in the actual scenario, the knives both hit the dictator, the dictator dies. Okay, and then we ask ourselves, hey, what if Casca hadn't thrown? What if Brutus had thrown alone? What if we had one cause without the other cause? How would things have unfolded? Well, one possibility is that... Um, Brutus would have felt nervous, he would have noticed that Casca had failed to throw, he would have felt nervous, and as a result he easily might have missed, and the dictator could have survived. So, in favor of thinking that this is the right answer, you don't have to invoke any miracles. Everybody acts purely in character. Brutus is that sensitive soul who feels nervous when it all falls on him. Uh, so there are no miracles involved. But there is less spatiotemporal overlap. The trajectory of the knife is a little bit different, and the dictator survives. Okay, so in the actual scenario, the dictator dies. In this scenario, he lives. Uh, so there's less overlap. So that's one possibility. This is the possibility I favor. If this is the right answer to the question, what if Brutus had thrown alone, then we have a counterexample to Bennett. Non-reductive physicalism is in trouble. But Lewis says, hey, think about this possibility. Maybe if Brutus had thrown alone, and Casca hadn't thrown, um, Maybe, uh, due to some miracle, Brutus would fail to notice that Casca had thrown alone. He's always noticed in the past, but maybe this time he fails. Maybe the light stops before it hits his retinas. Or the light hits his retinas, but he acts out of character. He uncharacteristically 
fails to notice, or he notices and uncharacteristically fails to feel nervous as a result. Something happens out of character, maybe even something miraculous is required to keep Brutus from feeling nervous. Um, so, perhaps uh, Brutus would have felt normal, he wouldn't have felt nervous, he, his throws are highly accurate, and the dictator would have died. So in favor of this view, um, we get to maximize spatiotemporal overlap. The dictator still dies on this possibility. Against this view, we've got to invoke some miracles, or at least people acting out of character. It's contrary to what has happened every time in the past. So this is an important question. Which one should we prefer? If we should prefer this one, we've got a counterexample to Bennett. If Lewis is right and we should prefer this one, uh, then there's no counterexample to Bennett. So let me say a few words in favor of this one. Um, it seems to me that if you prefer this scenario, your reasoning in what we might call a theoretical way, you're starting with a theory about how counterfactuals work, a theory of what makes worlds more similar uh, to other worlds, and you're asking the theory, what do you rule in this case? Given that we should favor small local uh, violations of law to maximize spatiotemporal overlap, which scenario should we favor? Oh, this one. So you consult the theory, you get the theory's verdict, and then you make your choice based on the theory. The alternative is what you might call an intuitive approach. You start with the data, namely you just ask yourself about the counterfactual. Um, if Brutus had thrown alone, the dictator still would have died. And you just consult your linguistic intuitions about that counterfactual. You're a competent speaker of English, you understand the scenario as it was described, and you make a judgment about the truth or falsity of that counterfactual. It strikes me as fairly obvious that that counterfactual is false. It's not true that the dictator still would have died. Brutus easily might have missed because he would have felt nervous. Um, so we've got two different approaches here. And in favor of the intuitive approach, let me just point out that uh, I think that's the right way to do philosophy. I mean, at least that's how people do science uh, in this broadly inductive way. You amass your observations, you run some experiments, make some observations, and then you evaluate theories in light of the observations. In science, at least, you don't start with a theory, ask the theory, what would you rule in this scenario, and then don't even bother to make the observation, just consult the theory. You don't do that. Rather, you uh, approach the question in this broadly inductive way. And I think that's the right way to approach philosophy as well. And I think that uh, Lewis himself would agree. Elsewhere, when talking about his theory of counterfactuals, he says this. The thing to do when evaluating um, his theory about the similarity relation, what makes worlds more similar to other worlds. He says the thing to do is not to start by deciding once and for all what we think about the similarity of worlds, so that afterwards we can use these decisions to test his proposed analysis on counterfactuals. Don't approach it in that theoretical way, starting with a theory about the similarity relation and getting it to issue verdicts about counterfactuals. Don't do that. Rather, we must use what we know about the truth and falsity of counterfactuals to see if we can find some sort of similarity relation. Not necessarily the first one that springs to mind that combines with my analysis to yield the proper truth conditions. So I think he agrees uh, that we should start with the data. We shouldn't ask our theories to interpret the data for us. Rather, we should consult the data, uh, namely our linguistic intuitions about ordinary language counterfactuals. So I think we should just consider this counterfactual. In the scenario as described, true or false, if Brutus had thrown alone, the dictator would still have died. And if you're like me, that strikes you as fairly obviously false. He might have died, but he easily might not have. Brutus would have felt nervous, and his aim would have been rendered inaccurate. All right, so if you agree with me, uh, this counterfactual strikes you as false, then we do have a counterexample to uh, Karen Bennett's version of non-reductive physicalism. So let me close with some implications for physicalism. Um, remember, this was non-reductive physicalism. This was Karen Bennett's view. We were concerned about overdetermination, the fact that uh, this view about mental causation fits our intuitive conception of overdetermination. We've got two simultaneous sufficient causes. We were concerned about overdetermination. Uh, Karen Bennett proposed a further necessary condition on overdetermination that she thinks non-reductive physicalism fails to meet. I tried to convince you that that necessary condition is not, after all, necessary. There are counterexamples. And so, you might think this puts some pressure on the non-reductive physicalist. The defense against overdetermination has failed. And that was really the best defense um, against the charge of overdetermination. 
So here's sort of the landscape in the philosophy of mind. Um, you've got some options here when you approach the philosophy of mind. You could be a reductive physicalist. You could identify mental states with uh, the corresponding brain states. Um, or you could be a non-reductive physicalism, as we've seen, a uh, non-reductive physicalist. Or you could be a dualist. So um, here's a brief history of the debate over the last 50 years or so. Reductive physicalism uh, is not as popular as it once was, largely for concerns about what's called multiple realizability. If our mental states are just identical with our brain states, well then creatures that don't share our exact brain states can't share our mental states. Uh, and that's struck a lot of philosophers as pretty wildly counterintuitive that, for example, an octopus couldn't feel pain because it doesn't share our exact brain state. Uh, so that pushed a lot of people out of the reductive physicalist camp into these two categories. But for reasons that we've already discussed, a lot of people think that dualism is unappealing, uh, for what you might call that luck argument. If the relationship between the mind and the brain is just contingent, then there are all these suspicious, fortuitous coincidences, there's systematic, widespread coincidence, um, that pushes you either towards, um, pushes you into a sort of design argument for theism, or pushes you back towards physicalism. Um, just sociological fact, a lot of people were not ready to uh, invite theism into their ontology, so they moved back to a kind of physicalism. Um, but if I'm right in what I've said over the last 30 minutes or so, there's still a major cost to non-reductive physicalism. Namely, it involves systematic widespread overdetermination. Every case of mental causation involves two sufficient causes. You might think that's superfluous or inelegant, unnecessarily complex. You might have epistemic concerns about why we should believe in the reality of mental causation if we can explain it just in terms of the physical causation. So I think that should push, put pressure on people to move out of the non-reductive physicalist camp. And just for what it's worth, I mean, this luck argument doesn't have to persuade you to give up dualism if you are open to that sort of design argument. If theism is not repulsive to your ontology, then you lose a lot of the reason to give up dualism. Um, and so, I mean, hey, just as a personal aside, I think this is probably the best of the three options. Um, all right, well, thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. <laughs>